today uh, started quite a few months ago, even before uh, we were uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and it's interesting to see that uh, I think that if anything, uh, COVID-19 has brought even more to the fore the need to really look for the connectivity across the, the different human rights represented by this, but also by many other mandates, uh, and what they have to do and why these connections are really essential uh, to protect life and to protect habitat rights and the right to the city. So just to start the conversation, um, I'm going to give the floor uh, to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Pedro Arrojo Agudo and just remind you that uh, the question that the invitation for each of the special rapporteurs was to let us know what are the three key priorities in their mandate in relation to habitat rights and the right to the city. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, well, it's difficult to, to select uh, three main uh, questions, objectives. Uh, when, I, when I am required to, uh, to, to say what are my main concerns, uh, I have always 10, 12, that in any case, um, as I am obliged <laughs> to select, let me uh, talk uh, about three questions. First one, I think we need to integrate uh, hygiene, including uh, menstrual, uh, that relating uh, to menstrual uh, health, uh, integrate hygiene and the obligation of uh, uh, return sanitation in the concept of human right to sanitation. Uh, another point uh, that remain, uh, remain a, a, a major challenge uh, is sanitation in rural areas. And when we, we talk about rural areas, we, we, must, we need to, to think especially in a specific space for dealing with uh, um, the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation in for uh, indig indigenous peoples. Uh, and finally, um, I think on uh, the question uh, related with, with cities or big uh, uh, populations, um, refugees camps and slums, uh, thinking on the perspective not uh, so far from here of the uh, climate uh, migrants and refugees. This could be three, three questions. I am, I am very, very concerned also. I have uh, important, very deep concerns on, on, on toxic pollution. Uh, for me is, is essential also with respect to safe drinking water and is increasing the amount of uh, uh, toxic pollutants uh, sometimes coming from the cities or from the uh, surrounding of the cities, industrial activities and so on, but mainly uh, with mining activities, it's not the cities, but uh, the, the, the contamination arrives to the cities uh, and uh, uh, the industrial agriculture with pesticides, very grave. Is, uh, and so, so and there we are in front of uh, toxic pollution cannot be removed by the the, the urban uh, plants for depuration. Uh, so finally, we were talking about uh, safe drinking water, uh, chlorinated with uh, improved systems and so on. And we have uh, heavy metals, or you have uh, pesticides or other kind of toxics uh, that give us properly water that is not properly safe drinking water. Many thanks, uh, Pedro. Very important issues in terms of the systemic connections, um, in terms of the where. Uh, so very important to highlight that we are not just talking about cities, but we are talking about um, a very wide spectrum of where's, <laughs> where, um, where rights uh, 
need to be advanced. And, uh, and also the important question of who and, and the many who's that are often forgotten, slum dwellers, migrants, people who are living in uh, refugee camps. Uh, so I think that this leads very nicely to, um, to the next intervention, which is going to be by Felipe, Felipe Gonzalez Morales. I remind you, UN Special Rapporteur uh, on the Human Rights of Migrants. Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adriana, and thanks for the invitation to participate at this uh, timely event. Um, there are many connections between my mandate as a Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants and, and the cities and the rights of the persons in the cities. And uh, I have um, uh, been an, a number of initiatives uh, along the, with the mayors with uh, civil society organizations uh, working on, um, on on the cities and, and so this event uh, also I think it's uh, very important in this regard. As it happened to Special Reporter Rojo, for myself it's, it's also very difficult to select three topics but I will do my best. Uh, the first one I would like to to emphasize is the issue of the access to public services. Um, which is a key aspect uh, of the life of uh, many migrants around the world. Um, and in this regard, uh, this uh, includes uh, access to health, especially at the time of the pandemic, but at all times, of course, access to education, access to justice, uh, access to, to housing, and so forth. In several of, uh, of my reports, uh, I have uh, stressed the need to establish strong firewalls between uh, public services and um, enforcement uh, migratory agencies uh, as a way to ensure that uh, migrants uh, are not afraid to go to a hospital, to the school, to a tribunal, um, to seek uh, social security, um, support uh, because of fear of uh, being detained and deported. Uh, and in this regard, I have welcomed the initiatives uh, of uh, many cities in, in the different continents, which uh, effectively establish uh, those uh, firewalls between the access to public services and the migration agencies that uh, enforce uh, migration laws. Uh, this is the same issue that in the US is called the sanctuary cities. The second point I would like to strengthen, um, I would like to stress, is the issue of regularization of migrants. Uh, this is also uh, strongly connected to the situation in the cities, the situation of migrants in the cities, because those who are in, a, in an irregular situation usually live in a very precarious lives. And in this regard, they may, they may, they may be harassed uh, by the police or by migra migratory agencies uh, or can be labeled or can be easily criminalized. Um, of course, regularization by itself uh, won't solution each and every problem, but uh, it's an important step forward. And uh, my mandate, along with the Committee on Migrant Workers, uh, have called on states uh, during the pandemic to uh, to conduct uh, regularization processes. So far, in fact, uh, most states uh, have uh, only extended temporary permits uh, uh, for those who are already in the countries. But I think this is something very important and has a clear impact in the lives uh, of migrants in the cities. And the third point, the third point is the, is uh, it's connected to the participation in the civic space. <clears throat> In my last report to the Human Rights Council, I addressed the issue of the freedom of association of uh, migrants and of their defenders. And uh, I selected this issue because uh, I think it has a transversal scope. In fact, it's a, it's a key element to ensure that uh, migrants can enjoy all their human rights. And uh, this is particularly true in in the context of cities where uh, migrants may be easily invisible and they need to have a, a voice uh, which is uh, here in the society and particularly in, in the cities. 
so in this regard, I think the, the right of association uh, implying uh, to form their own associations or to join associations that already exist uh, is a key right and important uh, uh, with an important connection to the lives of migrants in the cities. Thank you. Many, many thanks for that, Felipe. And um, I think that we're starting to feel mean about asking for just three priorities, <laughs> but thank you for sticking to that. Um, uh, Felipe, many thanks also for reminding us that uh, when we are talking about advancing rights and in a connected way, we're not only talking about uh, issues of access to, improve access, enhance access, redistribution, but also very important issues around the recognition of those that very often fall through the net, migrants being a key group uh, in that uh, suffering from that, and also uh, their, uh, the importance of seeking their parity of participation, you know, really enabling the spaces for them to also have a voice and a say in, in the places where they live. Uh, so I'm going to invite next uh, Victor Madrigal Borlos uh, to remind you. Victor is the UN Independent Expert on Protect Expert, sorry, on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adriana. And I'm looking at you to see whether you can hear me well. Thank you. I'm very thankful and very honored to be here. This is an occasion that actually presents uh, a pleasure in many fronts. It's a professional delight to be actually um, here joining your efforts to connect these issues and these areas of study. It's an institutional privilege to be, of course, joining Felipe and Raj and meeting Pedro. Uh, our new colleague that is joining us today. So wonderful to be with all of you and having a notion of privilege uh, by that. And then it's also a personal pleasure because unbeknownst to you, I actually have a failed career as an architect and I have a great passion for urban planning. And therefore this uh, event more like any other actually offers me an opportunity to connect my professional and personal passions in a very personal ways, so thank you for that. Now, Adriana, in her groundwork breaking work, Moira Kenny invites us to what I think it's an interesting exercise. Take away, she says, the identifiable markers of the gay and lesbian experience and imagine a social protest movement that throughout the 20th century has created an independent urban culture suffered police harassment, been legally subject to housing and employment discrimination, and in response, waged a campaign for social justice that has intensified over the last 50 years. The discussion of these particular stories reveals a set of cultures and communities for whom the city has not only been the location of struggle, but it has been the essence of that struggle as well. That's the end of the site by Maura Kenyon. Paradoxically, in the December 2016 process of adoption and endorsement of the United Nations New Urban Agenda, this key international policy framework adopted in December of 2016 to promote a new model of urban development that is able to integrate all facets of sustainable development to promote equity, welfare, and shared prosperity, LGBTQ plus people were erased from the final list at the demand of 17 countries led by Belarus and including Russia, Egypt, Qatar, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Malaysia, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, and Iran. The blocking states fall squarely among the 69 that have laws criminalizing homosexuality, six of them maintaining the death penalty and two with penalties that include life imprisonment. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the list also coincides in a significant manner with the very, very minority of states that opposed the renewal of my mandate. From this, you will see the political platform that informs the priorities of my mandate in relation to your areas of concern. First, 
safe streets, parks, public transports, and other spaces should be a right for all. There is a need for public authorities to take affirmative action. Sorry about that. Having a little bit of trouble with my computer right now. To take affirmative action to ensure the protection of LGBT persons to shaming, exclusion, and abuse in public space. This is a first item in what I consider to be a crucial agenda. And if I may connect it to what Felipe was mentioning, which is political occupancy of public space in full awareness in the case of my mandate that LGBTQ plus identities are more than to be exercised in the private space. They constitute political identities that require and deserve political occupancy to gain relevance in the political spectrum. Second, decriminalization, continued engagement and promotion of tolerance, diversity and pluralistic views need to be a priority. Not only explicit criminalization, but the deconstruction of all laws that are applicable in public space and particularly in the urban space and which are used to continually criminalize LGTB existences and in particular create notions of antisocial behavior by LGBT individuals. Third, better relations, increased trainings and open lines of communication between LGTB communities and police are essential to ensuring that authorities understand the heightened risk that LGTB persons face while interacting with and merely existing in public spaces. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much, Victor, uh, for that. And thanks to all as well for sticking to the time. Uh, I know how much uh, you have to say. Um, I mean, again, uh, wonderful additions and, uh, and a very important reminder as to how it is that uh, social identities, and, and, and this is particularly true for, you know, for certain groups, uh, are, you know, are used in a systemic way, uh, not only for exclusion, marginalization, but even you know, go all the way to criminalization. And how, you know, and the power as well of, in this case, local uh, authorities, uh, but many others, to really fight against this process of uh, criminalization on an everyday basis. And I think that the reference to a public space, to have a right to the city, to be part also of this political occupancy that you referred to is uh, essential ingredients to the discussion we are having today. Um, I'm going to uh, invite uh, Raj uh, for um, our last uh, intervention within this first round. And again, to remind you, Raj is the Balakrishnan Rajaga Gopal is the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing. Raj, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adriana. Um, uh, let me also thank all the organizations here uh, for it, organizing this great event. Um, and my greetings to everyone, including my fellow rapporteurs here. Um, I welcome this dialogue and I hope that uh, we will have further chances to discuss many of the issues that emerge from this. Um, in terms of uh, the three priorities that are actually link best with uh, the right to the city uh, and habitat rights, uh, let me mention uh, them um, in order. Uh, first, um, I believe that the issue of spatial segregation and discrimination and housing are extraordinarily important, have manifested themselves in more and more stark ways in around the world in a phenomenon that uh, many urban scholars um, and in my own past work uh, refer to this as a new form of apartheid that is emerging in cities where, with uh, a ghetto-like existence for particular communities discriminated along ethnic, racial, religious, or on the lines of sexual orientation or gender identity for that matter. Um, uh, and I believe uh, that this is an issue that deserves further investigation. And uh, I intend to devote my next General Assembly report to this topic. 
just to clarify also that uh, the title of uh, my mandate is actually quite long. It goes beyond the right to adequate housing and has the word non-discrimination in its context very specifically. And it's interesting that uh, so far, uh, in fact, in the history of the mandate, there has not been a much more systematic attempt to look at what exactly does that mean in the context of housing so far. So that will provide me an opportunity to get into the nitty gritty of non-discrimination, especially as it plays out in terms of spatial segregation in cities uh, and other human settlements. A uh, second issue that I think is very closely related to right to the city and habitat rights uh, that I think would be a good priority for me is the question of rethinking land governance beyond tenure security, particularly in terms of rethinking property in land and housing. Um, housing and land, of course, are the foundations of the solidarity, solidarity economy, particularly the economic, the economic challenges that we will face in the post-COVID era centrally call for reimagining the way we have been building our economic development systems so far. And I believe that uh, land governance and rethinking land governance uh, is going to be a central challenge there. But I believe that there is a need to decommodify land um, and to rethink property uh, in terms of its social function uh, to relate to the, the specific challenges that we have. Um, and I also believe that uh, rethinking land governance in this way will also allow us to kind of think about the issue of land and housing along a continuum from rural to urban instead of boxing them into one or the other. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, it may also help us to sort of rethink the question of sovereignty over land, including such crucial issues like eminent domain, which need to be unpacked, uh, particularly in the context of the ability of communities to be able to control the land on which they, the, as human settlements, they actually lead their lives. Um, there are both questions of international law, such as permanent sovereignty over natural resources, as well as questions of domestic and other laws that need to be taken on. Uh, finally, um, the last challenge, perhaps uh, that relates closely to um, uh, the right to the city and habitat rights has to do with uh, for climate change and housing, where clearly a tsunami of uh, uh, displacement is coming or is happening already around the world, thanks to the multitude of causes relating to climate change that are producing vast numbers of people to be displaced and moved. Uh, that's actually a tricky question because on the one hand, there is the question of the right to remain of those communities who do not want to be moved or who are who know quite well from experience, for example, from the last tsunami, uh, the great Asian tsunami of 2004, that in the name of resettling communities affected by, you know, uh, catastrophic natural events, there's a great deal of land grabbing that actually happens. So they are much more cautious about it. But on the other hand, there is also a right to leave as opposed to the right to remain when they are actually at risk. They're feeling the need to actually be moved. Uh, and the principles and uh, procedures and uh, the legal standards for that matter that apply to such situations. For example, when it comes to climate induced displacement and how resettlement should happen under those conditions with the full buy-in and consent of the communities concerned is one, going to be one of the crucial issues going forward. Um, climate change, I think, also raises the question of uh, a much more pluriversal approach to housing, where we can begin to valorize or revalorize rural, indigenous, and other forms of housing, including deeper questions about building technology and uh, transport and a number of other systems that actually bolster housing. Uh, I think that. You know, that basically calls for reimagining the urban fabric, the way we think about it. So um, in terms of the relationship between these issues, our priorities and right to the city and, uh, um, and uh, habitat rights, I believe there are many, many linkages. Perhaps uh, uh, I could sort of help unpack some of that during uh, further interaction or discussion time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Um, 
for bringing um, also very much in perspective <laughs> your mandate and helping us remember that it's not just about access to housing or even access to houses as it, it, it might often be interpreted. 